Well, we're welcoming okay. here. Uh, you know, we're very excited to have him on. He's had a legendary career spanning uh, seven oh. decades. He started alongside Clint Eastwood and Escape from Alcatraz. He appeared in uh, such classics, Plane, Trains, and Automobiles, Home Alone, The Jerk, Billy Madison. You might remember him from Friends and Breaking Bad. And of course, and most important and pertinent to us, he played Tom Pepper, a.k.a. Kramer, in the season four season finale of Seinfeld, the pilot. Please welcome Larry Hankin. Thank you so much, Larry. I can't follow that. Thank you and good night. <laughs> <laughs> Larry, welcome to this podcast is making me thirsty. So t- so what I'm most interested in, take us back to 1989, right? <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Mm. Yeah. Boom, no internet, nothing. Okay. <laughs> now what so, do we do? You're, you're 30 <laughs> years, 30 years into your career at that point, right? I guess. Yeah. The, show Seinfeld, so. the show Seinfeld comes out. Yeah. You get the call to audition for Kramer. Take us right. back to that moment. Oh man. Uh yeah, well, it was a very uh I, I get um I have an attitude problem. I, I, I'm pretty much, I think, over it. <laughs> but I had it back then. I, I did. So I'd get insulted at the slightest thing because all I wanted was respect. So uh, when I, I got the call uh, to do Kramer, because I was a big fan of Kramer, of Michael, because we, I, I knew him from before. Uh, no, uh, well, I, I didn't know him. Wait a minute. There's two auditions. Yeah, we're talking about the first, yeah, the first one. Yeah, the first one. Okay, for Kramer. Where, that that wasn't yeah. as bad as the second one. Uh, okay, so I auditioned for the role. So they weren't even on the air. So there was no cream. It was just an open audition. Okay, right. so that was cool because, you know, you're there with a lot of other people and uh, some were fat, some were tall. So none of, some eventually never looked like either Kramer or Michael. You're the real Kramer or Michael. They're fat, short, bald, whatever. I mean, beards, without beards. Okay. and. So I auditioned, and uh, it was very easy audition. It was very simple audition. That, that was kind of cool. Um, I don't remember anything specific that's worth, uh, you know, a lot of time. So I, I just went home, and I, I okay, um, because it wasn't on the air. So uh, you know, it was just another stupid sitcom, right? <laughs> I didn't care. It was just another one. So I, I just went home. Okay. Um, it went on the air. Obviously, I didn't get it. Or my, my agent said, hey, you didn't get it. You know, fine. Okay, cool. That was okay. And then I saw who did get it. You know, Michael. Now I knew Michael. I thought, oh, wow, man. Uh, cool. I was glad for him. Because, uh, you know, if, if they get somebody, if I don't get a part and they get somebody who's really good, you know, who I, I like, I'll, I'll watch the show. Oh, I do that. If I don't get it, I'll watch the show to see who did get it. Right. You know, like, they got a ham? What the fuck? Are you kidding? You know, I just go into that. Right. <laughs> what were you thinking? What the? Okay. So, but but Kramer, I liked. I, I mean, I like Mike. So, but then I got a call to be, the, you know, a, a guy who's imitating Kramer. Kramer. That got, really got me, uh, my dander up. Because when I went into audition, it was the same people that I auditioned the first time plus a few strangers, but none of them looked like Michael or, or the real Kramer or me. They, they were, you know, fat, you know, short, tall, beards, bald. Uh, you know, and I, I couldn't figure that. I mean, I'm auditioning to somebody to imitate Kramer. Why are they here? Why aren't I the only one here? You know, I mean, I get into that. Uh, but I got, the, you know, I, uh, so I auditioned. Uh, okay. Oh, and then there was one guy. I knew everybody in the room. I knew uh, Costanza was there. Jerry was there. The director was there. Uh, you can always tell the director he's the sloppiest dressed and the oldest person. Oh, uh, Tom Sharon. Tom Sharon's was there, right? Tom, Tom Sharon. Well, at the time, he was the oldest yeah, person yeah, in yeah. the room. You know, and he was, you know, dressed like a director. <laughs> he didn't care. It's not his audition. You know, and then there was a <laughs> producer who had a suit on. But then there was a, a, another guy who I didn't know, or, you know, I never saw him. But, and he didn't say anything, the whole audition, which I was wondering what his purpose was. I knew the, you know, what everybody's purpose there was, except him. And then they said, well, thank you very much. And I'm just about to get up to leave. And he says, 
go in the door, uh, go out the door, go outside that door, Ralph, you know, the one uh, to the waiting room. Go out the door, come in like Kramer. That was all he said. Go out the door, come in like Kramer. Okay, I can understand that. Okay, that, that, that's a valid auditioning direction. <laughs> okay, so far everything's cool, I went in. You know, now I'm, I'm, when I go out, I'm in the room where everybody else is waiting to audition, plus the secretary. <clears throat> I didn't see anybody else go out the door and come in again. So that already, I go, well, am, do, am I mean that I get, I'm gonna get this? I don't, I don't understand. Okay, so I went out, went in. And then he said, the guy who told me to go, okay, thank you. And then everybody says, okay, you can leave. Boom, I went, all right. I don't know what happened. About four days later, I get another call from my agent. You got a call back, man. Whoa, okay, I go to the call back. It's exactly the same people. Fat, short, bald, beards, and me. And I'm starting to think, wait a minute, what the hell is going on? I look like Kramer. I did a really good audition. I came in the door and went out again. Come on, man. I go in and there's the same people and the same guy. Didn't say anything. At the end of the audition, he says, wait, go out the door and come in like Kramer. I mean, verbatim from the first time. So I went out and I come in. I auditioned for that role five times. The same guy, the same audition, the same people, five times. And I'm going, they're supposed to pay you after three. See, I'm even getting disturbed right now. You know? <laughs> Larry, I, mean, I think I'm gonna walk out on you guys. <laughs> Larry, were you were you were you pissed that they like Yes? No, no, no. What, what I mean is no, I know you're pissed, but like you didn't get the original Kramer role. Like when your agent said they want you to come back and do Kramer, were you like, fuck these guys? Like they didn't give me the original role or you just No, because I respected Michael and what he got was doing it. with Kramer. So, it was, they got yeah, a good guy, got man. Got and it. I also have worked with Kramer, but Michael. Michael. Yeah. So I know the difference between us and I understood why they picked Kramer. He goes over the top, I go under. There's a really two different styles sure, of comedy. Sure, and I thought for what Kramer is doing, he's the perfect guy. I would never have come up with the door thing, coming in and out of the door. That's brilliant. I watched him uh, when I finally got the part. Uh, I finally found out the, on the fifth time, when, I, when the same guy said the fucking same thing, he said, go out the door, come in like Kramer. So I, re I got angry. I, I mean, I was angry already because I brought four, four auditions worth of anger into that room. And when he said, I was gonna, I said, if he does the same thing, I'm gonna just tell him, you know, go shove it. Right in front of him, right in front of everybody. So he says, go out the door and come in again. And for a millionth of a second, I hesitate and I go, I'll go, let, let me find out something. So I went out and I went over to the, I didn't go right back in. I went out and I went over to the secretary and I said, who the fuck is that shooting in there? I was telling me to go out and come in the door. He's, Oh, he's got glasses. And she says, oh, that's Larry David. He owns the show. And I go, oh, oh <laughs> thank God. Thank God I asked. Because I went back in and, and I said, thank you very much. Thank you. I said it to the, to the guy, the guy I was going to kill. I said, thank you. Now, uh, just a, a tag. As I'm walking out, there, there's like the, the waiting room. But then there's a, 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 um, a hallway off of that. And there's a bunch of offices and you have to get to the elevator by walking from the room down the hallway to the elevator. And as I'm passing one door, it's open and the lights are on, out, it's dark, but I can look in there. And it looked like a homeless hoarder's room. It was just a, 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 a mess. Uh, not clothing and stuff, but, but papers and you know, writing stuff and books and scripts. And it was just a mess. It was so messy that I went back to the secretary and I said, okay, now tell me whose office that is. And she said, Larry David's. <laughs> okay, thank you. So you got the part and you, so take us to now you're shooting the, uh, you're shooting the episode. I can't hear Larry. you. What's going on? Oh, really? Oh, there you go. You, got yeah, me? You have to, have Can to you hear that me? close. Wow. Um, yeah, I was saying, take us to the actual shooting now. So you got the part and. You're on the set with Larry and the yeah. aforementioned Tom Sharon's um, and, and Jason Alexander and 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 uh, Michael Richards, who you had two, you know, one on ones with. And 
the one on ones with George, with Jason Alexander, with the raisins is, is one of the all time greatest Seinfeld scenes ever. Um, just trying to get your, your thoughts on just the set, like how it was to work. Was Larry hands on on the set? Any type no, of well, what, what Larry did. OK, what was going on on the set is uh, kind of interesting. Um, Larry David doesn't direct. Tom directs. Right. And so uh, he just stands on the side. Uh, with his arms folded, you know, across his chest, and he just watches. And then every once in a while, he'll say to Tom, "All right, hold it. I, I want to go talk to Michael," and he'll go over and say something to whoever it was. So uh, this is a, just a regular, you know, cast, and not any extras or me or anybody else. He'll go over to them, pull them aside, which I thought was very nice. I, I, by this time, by the time I got to the role and was on the set. No, Larry was a genius and, uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> respect is due. So, uh, and I would notice that he would take them off to the side and then he would say something to them. And then when they went back to the scene, whether or not they changed the lines, but they were funnier. And that, that struck me. I mean, I, I noticed that right off and I go, why isn't he talking to me? I can be funnier. <laughs> you know, he just talk to me, man. But, you know, so, uh, and you rehearse for four days and shoot. Okay. So around the third day, it finally happened. You know, he, he said, well, Tom, just hold it for a second. I want to talk to Larry. Oh, man, great. Um, so now my, uh, my uh, character of uh, Tom Pepper, I had a backstory for him, or at least an image of him. And I thought he was very passive aggressive on the, on the page. So I thought, well, the best way to approach that is to go Buster Keaton, just blank, do nothing, and then either let it explode because it's, you know, they're in there so long, or nothing bothers you, you know, or, or pretend nothing bothers you. So that's what I was doing, you know. Okay, so now Larry says, I want to talk to, uh, uh, Larry says, I want to talk to Larry. So he started talking to himself. No, uh, okay, so he goes over to Larry, me, and he goes, uh, and I was waiting for some gem to make me funny, you know, that he, did that, I, I saw him do that every day to one of those regulars. He comes over and he says, he takes me aside and he says, very quietly and personally, he says, I know what you're trying to do. And I got insulted at that because the key word that ticked me off was trying. And I said, so I just gave it right back to him. I go, oh really, what am I trying to do? And he goes, you're trying to do nothing. And it just blew my mind because that's exactly what I was trying to do. <laughs> you know, I think I, I thought I had him, you know. And I go, oh, wow. You know, I got really excited. He actually was watching what I was doing. <laughs> so he goes, so he goes, wow, yeah, that, that's, you're right. I, I am trying to do nothing. He says, well, you're doing something. And he walked away. And I thought, that's great, man. That is a great direction. He didn't tell me what to do. He just pinned me at, at what I wasn't getting to. That's a great, see, because directors, there's a, a great thing, but you, you, it's hard to direct an actor because you can't tell him what to do. You have to tell him, you have to give him an image or something else that gets him to where you want to go or where he wants to go. But directors who give you direction, like don't say it like that or lift the glass and then speak. I mean, that's, that's, not, that's a no-no. Well, that's what's that's what's so funny about that episode, right? Is George or Jason Alexander actually does that, right? He yeah. comes up to you and Jeremy Piven on on how to say certain words, and and Jerry has to pull him aside and say, well, "Don't don't do that," right? Um, take us back to that the famous scene, like with the raisins, right? Um, when did you first learn about that? Was that in the the reading that you had to do? Or... Yeah, it was all written. Uh, yeah, and in those days, um, Larry David wrote everything. You know, there, there's no no improv. Uh, well, for for new people, and sometimes even though everything is written scripted, um, written and scripted, uh, a director will see that some actor or or two actors work in a scene together that they're they're so loose that you go, oh, you know, just improvise. You know, just okay, try, drop the line, just go with it. Uh, I've seen that happen. It's done, done with me. Some actors can do it. I, I have difficulty. I, I spent like 10 years in Second City and the committee. And I've, you know, improvised for most of the 20s to 30, 20, 20, 
year old to 30 year old. That was all I was doing. So I know how to improvise, but I can't do it on the spot. I need a little time to just get, to switch my head over, you know, to improv as opposed to rote. Uh, so I don't do it much, but I, yeah, you can get loose. Not on that set. I didn't see any imp improvisation. Uh, and let's see, what was the scene you were referring to? Uh, the Raisins. Oh, The Raisins, yeah. Well, that uh, was just written as written, um, and we just did it as as written. And uh, uh, George Costanza, <laughs> uh, Alexander, uh, Alex. Does anybody call him Alex? No, I don't think so. Well, anyway, that guy, uh, he is a great guy to act with. There's certain people who are terrible to act with, even though they're good actors. They don't give right. you anything. Uh, but Jason is just great. I'll act with him any day, man. He makes you look better. Uh, Clint Eastwood taught me that, man. He, he, uh, not, he, not verbally. I mean, I was just acting with him and I was watching while I'm acting and watching him with other people. And he has a very unique acting style, which I try to use. And that's uh, why Costanza is so good. What great actors do is they ha they spend they spend no energy on their character. They spend all their energy riding on your energy. Like when I was acting with Clint Eastwood, uh, he would go, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I go, blah, blah, blah. And depending what I answered him with, he would, ma he would match it and just rise above it. So he's like a cork on your ocean. You know, you go, hey, hey okay you know or if he wants to go under but he takes your energy and he uses it and clint would do that all the time he would give you the scene let you run with it and he would just ride on your energy so no matter how high you pump the water the quark was always just a little above you he, that was the most amazing acting experience with clint he knows what he's doing so that's why i like jason alexander and that's why that scene worked so well because of, of Jason and I, we were two actors playing music. That's why it worked. Yeah, an incredible, incredible scene. Um, you mentioned the, the committee, the, the, you know, the, the improv group you were you were a part of or actually founded. Uh, that's um, I, I got to ask you while while you, since you brought it up, you know, this is the late '60s San Francisco. Um, you know, hate Ashbury, the Dead. Um, is it true? I, I read somewhere that you 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 did a show with the war with the warlocks before they're the Grateful Dead. I mean, were you you got any stories there with Jerry or anything you could share with us? Uh well, to to share, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a dangerous word. Um, to share, no, yeah, because okay, so that was that that was the height of the '60s, and and the committee was uh, very. We were very popular then. We, we, we were a hit, we were a big hit. People were flying up from uh, LA. So uh, we had our Monday nights and so, and, and we were in Greenwich uh, in North Beach. And that's where uh, the Warlocks, that's where uh, Jerry Garcia was, that's where Frank Zappa was, that, that's, where, that's where everybody was. In, in the sixth, in the Tommy Smothers, Bob Dylan, uh, everybody just came through and they all came to the committee. So I met the entire 60s, as, as did the, the rest of the committee. And then we would hang out, you know, if they were here for a night, I would, you know, go over to Berkeley and see their concert or, and I, you know, I'd get some comps or I would go around the corner to uh, Basin Street West, I think was the name of it. And Lenny Bruce was there and they would, and then Lenny Bruce would come and see us, Bob Dylan would come see us, everybody. It was a big 60s group and we all knew one another. And then when we went on the road, we would meet again, you know, the, the all the stand-up comedians, you know, Richie and George Carlin and uh, just everybody. Uh, uh, Eisen, uh, who? Eisenstein's brother. Uh, it was just all, everybody. So I knew all of them. Uh, interesting stories though. No, I don't remember because it was just like Janis Joplin, you know, was, she would come to the committee. They would hang with us. That's what they would do. You know, they would watch the show and then we would, you know, go uh, go to a bar if it wasn't closed or we'd go to a delicatessen or a restaurant and just hang. You know, uh, Lenny would come by 
uh, Lenny Bruce would come by during rehearsals in the afternoon. He would just sit in the back and watch. And then, you know, I, I would walk around with him. You know, sometimes he'd walk around with, uh, you know, uh, Bob Camp or somebody. You know, and he was just a guy. In, in other words, once you're not on stage, you know, then, then oh, I see, you do laundry too. I get it. Great. You're not, you're, you're not this icon. You're just a person. And that was really great. That was a, a great lesson. Love and Spoonful would come to see us. Uh, and I would hang around with Zal, and then they got busted, and then that was a big thing. But uh, Jerry Garcia, I, I never got to know him. He just played on Monday nights, or he'd come and watch the show. So it was just very casual. There's no, like, great stories. That never happened. In my life, the great stories happened when I was making, when I was working for somebody else. Mm. And, and then I had a whole different mindset. You know, I, I wanted, uh, you know, we were a big hit in San Francisco where people were flying in from all over the country to see us and all the stars and everything. And then you go down to Hollywood and you're like, you know, a one day player and you're nobody. And it was just like a shock, that, the difference. Like for instance, um, I was discovered by Penny Marshall. She flew up to see the show, and uh, about three days later, I got a call from uh, production of Laverne and Shirley. That was my first show. That was my first show uh, that down there. And so they said, uh, is, you know, I got a call from, no, I didn't have a manager. I got a call at home, yeah, from the production office. Yeah, uh, Larry Hankin, yeah. Um, Penny Marshall went up there and saw you. You're the tall comedian, right? Yeah. She says, she wants you, they're doing a, Laverne and Shirley is doing a prom night uh, episode. And uh, Laverne wants to, you to be the person that she dances with. So come on down. And that's how I got an agent. So I flew down. Uh, I didn't even have to audition. I, I just, you know, got the part. Uh, and, and, and then I, right after that show, that's when I got my agent. So she really discovered me and helped me, you know, get working and down there. The interesting thing about, uh, the, what was it? There, there is an interesting story about that. Oh, right. So we're rehearsing, me and Penny Marshall. <laughs> we're rehearsing on the, on the set. Nobody else is around. I think it was during lunch. So we, we, we just, so let, let's do it. Okay. So we're dancing and, we're, and she, you know, she's a shtick person. She likes jokes and, you know, weird things and flips. So one of the things she says, well, why don't we do a dip and you drop me, you know? And she's a physical comedian and she does have chops for falling. I mean, she, she knows, she's like a clown. She really has, can, she knows how to do pratfalls and stuff. So I thought, you know, that, oh, okay, that's pretty funny, you know? So I, I, I did it once and it was kind of awkward because she landed kind of hard. So I said, I don't, I don't feel good about this. I don't, I, I don't want to hurt you. You're a star. I don't want to hurt you. You know, so she, so I said, okay, well, here's a compromise. How about if I dipped you over the couch? See, then I could, I could drop you and you just fall on the couch. I think, and then she said, oh, that would be funny because then you could trip and fall on top of me. So we get two laughs instead of one. Oh, okay, fine. Let's do that. So we're working on it. I go to the couch. I got, I dip her. She falls on the couch and I trip and I fall on top of her and I hear, hey, what's going on around here? And I turn around and it's Gary Marshall. And he's the producer. And we, we said, what? Well, nothing. Well, we're rehearsing a scene for the, for the prom thing. And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. What's this touchy feely business? What touchy feely business? What are you talking about? <laughs> on the couch here. What is that? What is that? And I, <laughs> he's getting all Jewish on me. What is that? What is that? And so Penny, I look at Penny like, you know, help me here, you know, what's going on? And she just shrugs and she's, he's my older brother. <laughs> she just <laughs> well, She's protecting me. I mean, it's like whispered. He could probably hear it, but that's what she said. So I turned to him, I said, we're not doing anything. He said, well, you're not going to do anything more. No, no, none of that stuff. And he walks away. So we both shrug at each other. So we, we have got to cut that part out. So. <laughs> So from, from Penny Marshall to Jerry Garcia, back to Jerry Seinfeld. So, yeah, Laverne and Shirley, I mean, you were on some iconic shows, right? Seinfeld, Laverne yeah. and Shirley. 
My agent. He kept sending me. Hey, Mr. Mr. Belvedere, Alf. Like, how did how did these sitcoms compare? Right? Like, were there? We've heard some from some actors that Seinfeld was very business like. Were there any shenanigans you could you could kind of share with us that happened on the set versus, you know, what you might see on Friends or Laverne and Shirley, like you just mentioned? No, it, it, uh, they say it was business like. Um, uh, that's interesting because I think I know what they're talking about, and I just thought they were kind of stuck up. Mm. Uh, so, but it's the same thing. Yeah, it's a nice um, way of saying stuck up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, but but uh, in other words. I didn't feel uh, suppressed or in any danger or I could do what I want. I mean, yeah, creatively and uh, nobody on on Seinfeld, they did huddle up. I mean, I, that that's industry wide. And and that, that's probably what you call business like, because on all sets, I've done serious drama episodes Mm. and I've done sitcoms and I've done movies. Now movies, no, that's a different thing. Sit, uh, the sitcom episodic the regulars you know they're every week they're friends you know i've been doing it three four years right and then you're a one you're a one-off you're a, you're an extra you're a one-day player you come in for one part for one week wh- whatever that is and even if it's a, a, if it's episodic and they're shooting one camera you're there one day you know even if it's a major part but it's one day so after somebody says cut where there's that low where they either have to change the set or something like that. All of them, including Seinfeld, Friends, and they're like that. The business, like, they'll huddle up. They'll talk to one another, the, 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 the regulars. They'll go, oh, you know, what'd you do? With the so one day, you know, it's, they're not shutting you out, really. It's just they, there's nothing to do. You might as well talk to the people you know. I mean, you know, what, what are, they don't know me. I just showed up today. Yeah. You know, or whatever. So they're not going to come over to me and say, "Hey, you know, how was the, how was your night? How was your weekend?" Yeah, they just cuddle up. So I, I'm used to it. I, I used to get insulted, you know. What, what's wrong with me? Uh, but then one day, it was on a serious drama, though. Um, I decided to uh, uh, insert myself into the huddle, you know. I said, "Well, hey, man, I'm an actor too," you know. So I just joined in. And <laughs> this is a long time ago, uh, a couple of a couple of years ago. I said, you know, so I just stood there, you know, I just kind of, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then, and what they were talking about was their brand new cars they had bought. That's generally the conversation, the new mm. stuff they just bought. The regulars talked about that. Uh, Somebody's like a new driveway, you know, a, a new wing, <laughs> a new, something new. So they're talking about the new cars and what they were bragging about was where the, the GPS was on the dashboard. You know, so it's a, well, no, mine is uh, over here. I got this new, and and those days GPS was new. So if you had a car with a GPS already included, that was like hot shit for you know. It's like spinners on your wheels. Right. <laughs> it was, whoa, boy. Uh, so they're talking about. So then they turned to figure they were going to include me in the conversation. They said, "Well, Larry, uh, you know, where's your GPS?" I said, "Well, um, I bought it in uh, Best Buy. It's just the thing you had, and I just put it on my." dashboard and it's, it's a, got a suction cup you know and i just plug it in and i was out of the conversation they had nothing more to say to me Yo, know you, it's not on the dashboard you know included with the car no no i just got one and i plug it oh it's the weirdest thing i've ever seen <laughs> this was like i wasn't there all of a sudden <laughs> it's just I, I mean, I, I was I was laughing inside so hard I couldn't get insulted. I, I swear, God, it was just wow. The placement I had a handheld place GPS not good enough. Whoa! Oh my God! Hey, hey Larry. Amazing. Hey Larry, quick question. You you still you still get residuals from that Seinfeld? Uh, sure. You just uh, <laughs> just curious, like what what was the going rate? Doing a guest appearance on a show like that back back in ninety three. The going rate back then. Well, I, I, I probably is the same as now. I did probably ten grand. Oh no, it's like five thousand dollars or two thousand five hundred if it's less or somewhere around there between two thousand five hundred and five thousand dollars, depending on if you're coming in for one day. You know, I, I mean, like 
if you're like an extra, but you have one line or something like that. But if you have a role where you have to be there for five days, then that would be $5,000. And then you have to talk about, uh, there's three things. There's the part, this was taught to me at a young age by my first agent. There's the part, there's the money, and there's the billing. Make sure, Larry, you get two of any of those three. That's it. Mm -hmm. So um, if you get all three, then you're doing okay. But if you're just getting two of those and you maybe then you're only getting one, uh, th that's different, you know? It's, uh, I, and I'm sure it affects how you walk around when you're not on camera. You know, whether you're an extra or you're a star or you're a regular or you're a, you know, whatever. It, 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 yeah. I, to me, it, it, it gets to my psyche. That's why I get so bugged when, you and know, they, they, they hired him and not me. What the hell is going on? But I, I, I feel that I can do that because I don't feel like I'm, I'm not an actor. I, I really am not. Uh, in other words, I can act, yes. And sometimes I can act really good. I mean, Escape from Alcatraz, I liked what I did. I watched mm -hmm. it. That guy's a good actor. But I'm not an actor. And here's what I use to differentiate. You know, have you ever seen Mr. and Mrs. Smith, the movie Mr. and Mrs. Smith? Years ago, yeah. Uh, with a, uh, 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 oh, they were married. Jolie, uh, uh, Jolie and- uh, Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt. Yeah, have you seen it? Because uh, I'm going to refer to you, it. You're not in it, are you? No, I'm not in it, but I just use that as a- as uh, a yeah. Have you seen it? Years ago, really? I saw it, yeah. Years ago, yeah. Okay, there's one scene, if you saw it at all, there's yeah. one scene you'll remember. And that is they're fighting and they're in, a, in an apartment or in a house and they're shooting at each other. They're yes. arguing with each other. They're I making remember, love to yes. each other. They're hitting one another. They're shooting. They're fighting. They're rolling around, running from room to room. That's acting. See, that's, I can't do that. I'm, I'm not an actor. I, I, I'm just, I, I, I can act if you give me the right part. So I, I don't, so, so I, can, I can get mad. If I was really an actor, then, then I would try to be better. That would be all, all. I, I wouldn't get mad. See, if I'm a, I'm a, I was a stand-up comedian. I, I have called myself, I've named myself a stand-up social anthropologist. That's what I am. That's what I did for a living. It was great. So when I got booed or anything, I didn't get angry or mad. It just wasn't my crowd. That was all. I made that adjustment. You're not booing me. You just don't get what I'm doing. Okay, that's cool. That's that's you. That's me. Because in other venues, I would get huge laughs. So I was being. I knew I was okay. So if you're not laughing at me, it's on you. It has nothing to do with me. So, but but as an actor, I can just laugh or get mad because it means not. It, well, it means something because I care. Mm. But I mean, it means nothing. Your your reaction to it, whether I'm bad or good or you know, it's, I don't, that doesn't bother me because I'm not an actor. So you have a right to say you did it wrong. I'm not an actor. <laughs> you know, it just saves me a lot of real angst. It makes you sense. Know. That makes sense. Um, so the, the episode you were on though was a, was a season finale part two part or hour long. Was that shot any different? Meaning like, you know, when you oh, mentioned in the Seinfeld thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're on there. Yeah. It was totally always, different. Was all your stuff was, shot at the same time? Like, you know, okay, so, so here's, here, I see, where, yeah, I, I see what you guys are trying to, where you're going. <laughs> Do you? The, the interesting <laughs> I know, stuff. Somewhere I'm going sometimes. My well, yeah, but no, no. But no, the interesting stuff in my life yeah. is not the stuff that you <laughs> see and want to talk about. No, we, we'll talk about anything. We're just, yeah, no, no, I, I, no, no, there's, no I'm, not, I'm, I'm not picking this out. I'm yeah. just, you know, oh, I'm, I'm off. I keep on shifting oh, i see why yes, no well that's not interesting that, but this is interesting no that's okay <laughs> you can that's go wherever cool. you want you are interesting so whatever you're saying we're that's, interested yeah so uh cool. but the, the interesting thing about um Just, uh, like no. uh, what we, the, Sein, the, the, the seinfeld thing is that um well, I, I, no, I, for, I forgot what, what the question was. Really? So. Just, I was just curious working. I mean, you know, we talked oh, about the working with Jason. Stuff. Yeah, we're talking about working with Michael Richards since you guys already knew each yes. other. You had auditioned for that role. Now you're in a one-on-one -on -one scene with him. You know, we're talking, you know, how, how did that, how, you know, was it comfortable for you? I'm assuming no, I, I, I kind of liked 
I liked the character I was doing of Tom Pepper. I yeah. really liked how Larry wrote it with this, you know, suppressed anger and then exploding and on the ridiculousness of what he was getting angry. And, dried fruit no more dry yeah, yeah. Fruit, great line, you know, great line. right i'm gonna take this and shove it down your throat you know i it just i, I laughed just why you know reading the yeah. thing so when you're doing a, a scene with somebody who can act with with you like costanza like alex it's a pleasure because you can unload and you know the guy's going to take it and use it because he's funnier than you are you know, in other words, you, what you're doing is by me going ah, ah to another actor, that's what you're giving him. That's the energy that Clint Eastwood would work on. So, uh, you know, so if you're working with a good actor, it just makes you so much better because it relaxes you and it makes you get into it. It's just a weird thing. It's not conscious. It's totally I mean, the, the, coffee, the coffee shop scene with Kramer, when he's talking about, you know, have the woman go on, have the woman go on top. Like, how do you keep, how many takes did that take? How did you keep a straight face? You mean, the, mean the, the, the one where we're just talking yes. side by side? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, yes. I'm Kramer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. No, no, I'm Kramer. Uh, that, that thought, well, as soon as I read that at home, before I even showed up, I thought, that's fucking brilliant. Because I pictured exactly what they, how they filmed it. So when I read it, that's what I pictured and we were doing it. And I thought that is classic, man, because Kramer was an icon. Oh, okay. Here's what I was, when I said I forgot what I was, what I was talking about. This is what I was talking about, about what happens on the set for Tom Pepper. Um, the unique thing that you guys want to know about is nothing that happened on camera. It's off camera. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Where's so, the dirt? Yeah, give here's us something. the dirt. Um, so I'm way, I, because there be, and it happened because there was no audience, which you mentioned, and that's what keyed me off. The, the, there was no audience. We were just shooting it straight for two weeks, but with no audience. Uh, and the reason was that they thought, uh, or, or they shot it. No, they, they shot it in the same, in the same week, but they shot two shows in, in one week with no audience. And the reason was that they didn't want to hold an audience because they were shooting on it one day. It was episodic, it, it, it connected. Uh, they didn't want to hold an audience for two shows. That's way too long for people to sit. Two, that's two and a half hours of shooting just to sit in the bleachers. So they divided it up and they didn't want to then, you know, get people out and bring in a new crowd because that hour between of getting them out and getting them in and cleaning up the seats and everything like that that's an hour between the first episode and the second episode they didn't want to lose the energy they wanted it to be continuous okay so that's the set that's the setting that this happened in so there's nobody in the bleachers and everybody's just it's like shooting a movie only with three cameras okay mm -hmm. so i'm sitting up in the bleachers and i'm watching there's two things the suits and kramer Michael Richards. So I'm sitting up in the bleachers watching them shoot the scene. All of a sudden, that is two sets. One is the office where we audition, and then there's the home of Seinfeld. So the two sets together. Okay, so they're doing everything at home with Seinfeld over here. I'm in the bleachers, and this set is empty with the office. All of a sudden, I see the door pop open in the office that's empty. And in walks Kramer with the pipe and with the suit. He's got his costume on already. He's got a pipe. And he's coming in. And he's just coming in the door, going back out, coming in the door. He's rehearsing his entrance because he's working on his door. You know, he, he made an art form of coming in that door. So now I'm watching this iconic piece of shtick that everybody loves, right. I'm watching it being created. He is now creating how to come into an office if he's not in Seinfeld's off, uh, apartment and he was looking for a job. So that's, that's what's in his backstory. It's got to be different, but the same. And I'm watching that for like 20 minutes, man. That's all he did. It's like the guy's nuts. That's what I was thinking. The guy's nuts. He's just OCD. That's what it was, OCD. Just coming in and coming out. Now, 
I'm sitting there watching him and that, that's all cool. I'm gathering my information for when I want to work on a shtick. Here's the master right here. And I figure, oh, I see what he's trying to do. Let me help him. So I go down and I, and he, he just comes in the door and I go, hey, can I talk to you for a second? And he just like, he did like a, a Kramer take. He went, whoa, 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 like that. And I go, oh my God, what, what have I done? And he goes, yeah, what, 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 what? Now he knows me, we've worked together. But he didn't know me, right? At that moment, he didn't want to talk to me. He, he was locked, you know? She says, what, what, what's going on? And I go, um, well, you know, you're coming in with the pipe and the thing and trying to get the doorknob and you're putting it in it. So if you put the pipe in this hand and open the doorknob and then so you can come in. Yeah, so I worked it out for him. I said, because uh, I've been watching you. Just you're watching me? I go, yeah, yeah, but he says, thank you. Okay. And he's very standoffish, like I'm going to hit him or something. He said, thank you. And I go, wow. I mean, I know this guy. What? Okay. I thought, okay, I'm sorry. And I figured, well, I just disturbed him. So I turn, I go back up in the bleachers and he left. He wouldn't rehearse anymore. And then when he, when it was time for him to shoot, he did it completely different. He probably went into his dressing room and rehearsed a whole different thing because I was watching him. I mean, that's a man that, I mean, everybody's, you know, way of getting to where they want to be. It's just weird. Okay, so the other thing that you want to know about is, is me. Okay, I noticed something while I was rehearsing because I'm doing Kramer. So I'd rehearse. And, you know, then we, we would run it three or four times and I would go, I would go, and I noticed there was no suits on the set during the entire thing. And then when I got up to come on the floor and rehearse, all of a sudden, three suits came in and stood at the edge of the light of the set. And they just stood there with their hands folded across like that. And they just stood there. Didn't say anything, they didn't talk to one another, didn't talk to anybody. They just stood there while I rehearsed. And every time I left, they left. So that was a pattern that I picked up on real fast. And I go over to one of the, I, I think it was the director or something. And I said, what the fuck is going on with these suits? Every time I go up, uh, and there, there's these three suits show up and they start watching me. What's going on? They said, uh, they're from upstairs. They're producers. Um, you're playing an icon for the uh, station. So they're watching to see you don't fuck it up. Really? <laughs> yeah. Did, uh, Larry, did Jeremy Piven have a, like a similar take on that? Were they watching him? Did you guys interact a lot? No, he claims. I, no, I told you, man. Uh, you, you're doing an icon for uh, NBC or CBS. Mm. They meant they said that's what they said, the icon. You are yeah. doing an icon for, for the upstairs. They don't want you to fuck it up. That, they weren't kidding around. That was like why they were there. And, and nobody else, they didn't show up for anybody else. I told you, that's oh, what the yeah. pattern was. Had they come and just stood there for everybody, then I would understand. Well, yeah. So they looked I mean, at Kramer as the icon uh, above everyone else. Then it's about, above everyone else. I went over to Jeremy Piven and I said to him, uh, just about his part, like right. my part, you know, the second company. I thought he was great. I thought, hey man, you're really great. But he wasn't Jeremy Piven then. He was just another actor, you know, like me. Right. He wasn't famous at all, but I, Man, I spotted him. He was cool. So I, I know I know where there were no suits probably on um, the shooting of uh, How to Become an Outlaw, which I, I watched and uh, thoroughly enjoyed. Oh, wow. Um, Thank you. When you said you were riding your bike earlier when we called, I could not help but think uh, of that, of your movie. Uh, are you riding around town like that? I just, I, got, I mean, I, I'm picturing, you know, with the whole, is that how you go about your day? Uh, no, typically, that was, or that was just that was just for the movie. No, that was a movie. No, talk it's, about the making it's a of that movie. Uh, it's, no, I know. Hey no, guys, I, it's a movie. <laughs> I'm an actor. Wait, you're not in? No, just joking. <laughs> um, how to become an owl, though? Seriously, though, that was. Uh, well, I went around the world. I yeah, mean, it was I mean, very popular. Was, I did three of them. Did you? Well, did you watch the one where all three were the on at the same thing, time? Yeah, the, the hour long, the whole shebang. Uh, 
I oh, oh, wait a minute. There's like several different. I don't even know which one. There's there's one where there's just one each. I made three. Yeah, but they're all they put together one. into one big one. I thought. Yeah, so that's a website. twenty. No, so there's one that's just twenty three minutes. This was fifty nine minutes. I watched. Oh, you watched hour that long. one. You yeah, liked it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh man, that's my favorite. Yeah, it was amazing. I wanted to try and get some. Uh, it's. I put all of the Emmett Demas films together because in my mind always, and everybody thought I was nuts because they didn't know what I was doing, but in my mind. <laughs> I had an arc and a map of every time I did an Emmett Demas little film short, uh, I had where is this happening on his timeline, on his lifeline. So, um, so I could eventually edit it together, which I did, and it came out to be 59 minutes. And it's just a montage collage of the man's life. Right, right. Uh, it was in a festival. But uh, it, it's uh, it's to taste. It's al dente. Um, it, you gotta it, like it. I loved it. I mean, it had. A I lot. love it too. I it's think it's like the most Christopher cool. Guest ish meets Monty Python. You got yeah, Harry <laughs> David in there. My opinion, Quamless. That's a great. I'm I'm, I'm oh I'm Quamless. Quamless. <laughs> I'm assuming <laughs> I just that love that. Yeah, yeah. Did you was it written or was it all improv or did you write no, that? Like, that uh, no, that was written. They were my oh, okay. my scripts were all, all written. We, oh, we wow, improvised okay. a little bit. Not no, because I know you had Fred Willard and um, Jeff Garland and other big improv guys. I wasn't sure if. It oh, was... and you 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 rec see you got it. See, yeah. okay, yeah, yeah, there's yeah, several. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people get it, but there's people who just don't don't get it. But oh, no, I lo yeah. I love it. Thank yeah, you very great. much. I really yeah, yeah, appreciate yeah. that. Thank no, you. it was awesome. <clears throat> so, Larry, you know, just get a bit. You've had an incredible career, right? Seinfeld, we talked about. Uh, I'm, you know, Calvin. I'm beginning to listen to you guys and think, you know, I think I did have an incredible career. I never looked back. I was told by podcasters that I had done 182 shows. I never knew that. But here's the thing, Larry. You've literally had like two careers, right? Like the late 60s, like you mentioned, right. up to like let's say 89. And then like the Seinfeld friend stuff, Billy Madison, right? Like what are you most proud of? Or like, what are you most known for? What do people come up to you? Like, is it Carl? Uh, it's Kramer? Everybody through sad. town. Who, who's stopping it's you? To, what are they yelling sad. at you? What, what I'm proud of. What I'm proud of is being in the committee. What I'm proud of is being my, my stand-up was brilliant. Hmm. Um, I was opening for Miles Davis and the Kingston Trio and the Playboy Club. I mean, I had five. I think I had four show business lives. I had my, my stand-up life, which was really cool. Uh, I was traveling all over the United States. Uh, I had respect from all the stars that I opened for. Uh, uh, so, uh, so I had a committee, stand up, then TV sitcoms, then serious uh, dramas, and now my own work, which is film shorts, my own film shorts like uh, Emmett Demas, Sally's Diner got an Academy Award nomination for yeah. film short. So, uh, and I, I directed that one. So I have, I've had five different, boom, 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 but it was never uh, apparent to me. I just went until I got tired of something or I got so bored that I started to look for something else to do. And then I got hooked on that and did it until I get bored. I get bored very easily. I have, I'm a dyslexic. I have ADHD and dyslexia, which is very discombobulated. Now, Larry, you brushed it over the Playboy Club for our, for the younger audience, can you? Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, the Playboy Club was uh, a club by Hugh Hefner. It was invented by Hugh Hefner, created by Hugh Hefner uh, for the Playboy uh, magazine. Playboy magazine was, was uh, in the old days, a, a, a filthy little magazine, but has become, you know, uh, they had really good writers, good uh, opinion uh, sections. And they had Shel Silverstein as a cartoonist. So they had really good people. But basically, it was, uh, you know, as far as you could get nude-wise for the centerfold. It was famous for the centerfold. And then he got so rich from that, uh, the, you know, soft porn kind of stuff, that he opened Playboy Clubs. And then he, it was great because uh, it was a new venue for all the, of the stage performers, singers, uh, uh, musicians, and stand-up comedians. And I was one of them, you know, and we just worked the clubs. We just kept on going around and, and around. But uh, I, the Playboy Cubs were fine. Woody, I opened for Woody Allen. Uh, that was my first op big star that I opened for, Woody Allen. Uh, thank God for open mic nights. It made me what I am today. 
uh, because they're, they're very forgiving. Open mic nights are very forgiving. You only have three to five minutes. They'll they'll sit and wait if you sit, even if you're stupid, even if you're drooling. They'll they'll sit and wait for three to five minutes. They got the time. You know. Did you have a Did you have a go to like opener, opening line typically, back in those days? I don't understand an opening what. Like a joke, an opening joke. We're looking what for some you? bits from your old stand-up days. Yeah, we're going to get I some didn't bits. know. I see, I didn't do jokes. That's why it took me a little while longer than everyone. No, I told stories. I, I I don't tell jokes. I don't even know how to write a joke. I'm beginning to learn now. I'm beginning to learn how to write a joke. Were these, were these stories these obviously true stories? My day. They, they were true stories, just I like I'm telling you guys, exactly. true stories exactly. about my acting career, which was my life. I mean, I, I also, you know, had gr a girlfriend or two, uh, you know, and I raised a, a kid or two, not mine, but the girlfriends. So I had a life outside of show business, but nobody wants to hear about that. Or I haven't sussed it out enough to talk about it and get, make it funny yet. But I have enough distance from my acting for you guys to, to make it funny. But back in those days, everybody was smoking, you know, uh, marijuana or doing drugs and overdosing. It was a, it was a late 60s. Right. that I uh, stepped out of the committee. From 60 to 68, 60 to 69, I was in the committee. That was my life. And then from, then I got into sitcoms and I went down to LA. So that was my life. And then, uh, so when I was opening, doing open mic nights in, in Greenwich Village and I was stand-up comedian, uh, I was telling about my, my life off stage. Uh, I was a single kid around 18 and, you know, so that was funny. I, and it wasn't anything, it wasn't like show business or official. It was just a guy hanging around, you know, getting in fights, being beat up, uh, losing money, getting on the wrong thing, whatever, you know, just stuff. Uh, and, and then I started, and then, oh, okay. And then I started to get into critical thinking comedy. I started to watch George Carlin, Lenny Bruce, and then I started, and then that's when the great divide happens. You know, I get on stage with Miles Davis, and I can pick out the guys who smoke marijuana. Uh, these are the, the the coke freaks are in the back. You know, I was doing that kind of stuff: right. sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And then when I opened for the Love and Spoonful in Washington uh, University in St. Louis, Missouri. I started doing the exact same thing as the Playboy Club stuff and for uh, Miles Davis, and they booed me. They boo, boo, get off the stage, get off the stage. And they were pulling the armrests off and throwing them at me. These wooden armrests, they're really <laughs> heavy, man. Throwing the first two rows, throwing, get off the stage. So I talked to them and I go, hey, hey, stop, stop. I didn't get off the stage. I'm yelling, I'm yelling back at them. This is sex, drugs, and rock and roll. What's the matter with you people? You're college students. What are you, stupid? Come on, quiet. You know, and they actually listened to me. They stopped to listen to me rant at them. And they were just going like that. Like, nobody's ever done that. No, no, this is sex, drugs, rock and roll. I was talking about somebody's, you know, penis, you know, uh, is Johnson. And, you know, they, no, boo, 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 boo. And God, God was a thing. God, uh, so I, you know, I had this little, oh, God created you. What's between your legs there? We don't want to hear about God. No, boo. Fuck you. Fuck you. So they're throwing it. And so the love and spoon for off and says, no, keep going, keep going. They wanted the riot. They wanted the publicity, you know, right, so they're right. yelling at me. No, keep going. So I stopped and said, okay, I'll do clean material. And they shut up. They shut up. They go, oh, okay, fine. As long as you do clean so they're sitting, no girls threw anything, by the way. Just want to tell you that, no, no female. Uh, so, so, I, so I started, I have about 10 more minutes of clean material, I'm cherry picking. So I do 10 minutes, and then when I got a really big laugh, I go, okay, we're gonna talk about Johnson's and God now. <laughs> Boom! Oh, they, they thought, oh, fuck you. And then they turned the lights on in the auditorium and I see the guys in the back, in the back rows are pulling off their armrests and passing them down to the first two rows who were out of armrests by now. So they were, you know, the caissons are coming off. It was just, and then cops came down the road, uh, 10 cops on each side and pulled me off the stage. Incredible. So that's, that's what was going on. Incredible stories, man. This is, I listen to this all day long. This is incredible. Miles friggin' Davis, huh? 
Yeah, and he, he, wanted me to tour. he wanted me to tour with him. You oh, know, my to gosh. Go to Europe. And I turned him down because I thought, well, I, I, I want to get famous here first. But I, I should have went. But who cares? You know? Yeah, and, I mean, hell. that's. Uh, but, but I was very flattered, man. Are you kidding? Miles wanted me to open for him. Woo! That was cool. Jeez. Oh my gosh. I, I, this, this has been incredible, man. I'm, I'm, this is, we can't even, uh, we can't even thank you enough about this. Um, whoa, Miles Davis, you got, you know, you're, this is incredible. The, 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 the trajectory of your, the way you were saying it earlier, how you had five different showbiz, uh, lives, lives you know, it's just like your, your boy Emmett. It's like the road takes you where it takes you. Right. I guess that's, how you've been oh, living well, your life this whole time, just whatever I guess comes about, you're true. gonna, you know, you're gonna take on, and you know, whether it's, uh, you know, Breaking Bad or, or you know, this dark or Barry, these dark, you know, um, episodic type drama shows or something like, you know, Seinfeld, Friends, where you're just, uh, you yeah, know, comedy. I mean, I mean, it's whatever's gonna take is gonna take you, right? I uh, yeah, I just I guess because of the uh, my curiosity. I'm really curious, but also because of the dyslexia and the ADHD, uh, I get bored if nothing's going on and my mind will just go to something else to create. Like art, so, your artwork behind you, I know on your website. Yeah, yeah, oh, this my, yeah that's my yeah, artwork that's, right there. Yeah, See, so uh, I paint, you know, so if I have nothing to do, I'll, I'll, I'll paint, you know. So by the way, you know, I, I have a, a website called thereallarryhankin.com, yep. which is ridiculous because somebody stole my real name. The, 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 the site LarryHankin.com is owned by somebody else and he won't give it to me unless I pay him, you know, some hostage money. <laughs> so I just said, no, fuck it, you know. Well, we'll just call it the real LarryHankin.com. But I got my paintings up there. You can get them on T-shirts. You can, you know, I got my uh, film. <laughs> Larry, your, your, your traffic after this interview is going to explode. So just look out. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Austin, oh, Larry, Larry I've been hunting for you guys for two years. <laughs> I'm glad we tracked you down. Okay, ready? Can you see that? Yeah. If you yeah. Talk. I painted that. I painted that. Get out the of The elephant. Here. Yeah, yeah, that's on your website, the elephant. Oh, yeah, right. See, so you can get a t-shirt. You, really you can get doodles? that on the t-shirt. Did they start from doodles? You're, did you start doodling, yeah. then you just turn it into that? Yeah, I doodle. Uh, that, that, uh, both of them. Well, all my paintings start on a piece of newspaper. I, I start on newspaper. I, I read the newspaper. And you start and doodling. There's and a, then... uh, well, I either get an idea, I'll see something, and I'll do it on the newspaper. You know who else is a big doodler is uh, Peter Melman, writer for Seinfeld. We talked to him about that. I don't know oh, really? Yeah. Directors uh, and then I just put it into, uh, I take the drawing and I... It's true. <laughs> I'm a so big doodler too. No, I'm, I'm, he's laughing at me because I always talk about doodling. I'm a big doodler. Whenever I talk to someone who likes to doodle, <laughs> plus doodle's a funny word. To say. <laughs> okay, do you, know, do you know who Roger Price is? I don't know. You don't? No, no. Oh, so man, I got the you book are. for you. I got the book for you. It's called, and, and I don't know if you ever heard of it. It's called Droodles. D R O O D L E S. Oh, Roger Price. Yeah. Yeah, Roger Price, Droodles. Well, Are you, you should. Serious so how? You really know who he is? Yeah, he does. Yeah. He does. Uh, oh, by, by 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 the way, my name isn't Marty. You yeah, what's up with Marty. that? Uh, I did. A, I, I I had to do a, a cartoon uh, version for an interview for somebody else, not for, for Carl Gottlieb. They were interviewing Carl Gottlieb, who wrote Joyce. Right, who's, right. He's yeah. a good friend of mine. He's my yeah. best friend. Um, so they were interviewing him and they wanted to interview the shark, Jaws, you know. So they got a picture of the shark and they wanted it to have a voice to interview the shark. So I was the shark of Jaws and his, and they we had to give him a name. So I named him Marty. So that's left over from Marty the shark interview. Uh, but they, they put it on there, on their Zoom because they started it. So every time I go on Zoom, Marty comes up. I have to change it. Well, it's too late now. So you, how could, Jaws, obviously, I mean, geez. How come he didn't put you in that movie? Because, because hey, man, you no, you don't do that. No? <laughs> no, nah, he, he wrote it. I mean, no, that was too fucking big a gamble on uh, Spielberg's and the producer's part and Carl's part 
uh, I wouldn't invite any of my friends on. I wouldn't invite anybody on. In other words, I wouldn't interfere with what he, what was going on. There's certain movies you, you do. I, I um, for uh, uh, Billy Madison, right. I told the director who was a friend of mine. I said, "Hey, put me in the fucking movie, man. Why? Okay. I want to meet uh, Adam, and I want to be in a movie. I need the money. I mean, you're you're a friend. You're my friend. Put me in a movie." So he did. Oh, interesting. So, I was so, going to ask you about that. But there's a difference. There's a difference between what, where, what your stature is in the pecking order of the movie you're on. And Carl just wanted that movie to go. You know, he didn't want any kind of side effects. You know, sure, that makes sense. Fair enough. I don't like my friend or something. So the Billy Madison. So, so I mean, that was Sandler's first, really, and to me, in my opinion, his best. But. Um, he wasn't really, I mean, SNL, yes, but he wasn't a star. You knew that was going to be big, so you are like, put me on this fucking movie? Or was it just like, I mean, was it was it Sandler specifically? You wanted to jump in on that and see, you know? No, no, I, I was working. I was, I don't, you know, I don't go around asking for people for jobs. <laughs> no, no, working. no, I just, what I meant was, <laughs> was it known that that was going to be a hit? Because no one really could tell, I don't of think. Of course not. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You didn't know that Sandler was Sandler at that point. I mean, it wasn't like. Uh, no, no, he was no, no. I knew who Sandler was. I'm a we, stand up. You know, social I'm anthropologist, not, I'm not man. Right. I'm not asking it right. What I'm saying is, when you're shooting it and when you're there, no one, you, you, no one saw becoming the hit. It was going to become obviously, no, right? No, so that's no. what, that's all I was getting at. If was anything on the set where you were like, "This is this no, is no," great but first. but there's certain there's certain yeah. people and certain. No, he did the truck movie Spielberg. And then he did the fish movie. You know that where the truck is following that that guy and you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, he he had his chops. He had his bones. No, right, right. Spielberg was Spielberg by the time he got Jaws, but that had nothing to do with it. it it's just where, I, if you know, I knew. I, first of all, I was working, so I didn't need a job. <laughs> and that was that was the first thing. When when uh, when my friend was directing uh, Billy Madison, uh, I didn't have a job, and I needed money. So, oh, my friend is directing a movie. I'm going to get a job. And I, I, and he wanted me to cut my hair. I mean, it wasn't like a freebie. Oh, yeah, come on. Come on, Larry. No, I was a hippie. I had hair down to here. I was proud of my long hair. It took me months to grow that yeah. crap in. And then, you know, I said, put me in the movie. And he says, well, you have to cut your hair, man. And I go, no, I'll put it up on a ponytail. And he goes, no, then you're not in the movie. Now, this is my best friend. And he said, either cut your hair or you're not in the movie. That's my best friend. I okay. I cut my hair. I mean, you know. Now Carl is in that the, the fish movie, and uh, I was working. I didn't even approach him. I probably was on the other side of the country by then. You know, I was traveling or whatever. So it's a you know, it's it's a, it's a crapshoot. It depends on what's going on right this second, where I go, sure, and, and how I act. Really, has uh, and I'm just curious because obviously Larry David's gone out to do a lot of things. Sam, they're like, have they ever invited you back to other movies or on, on Yeah, Earth? yeah, but I blew them both. You know, I blew them both off. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, blew, I, I, blew the, I blew the gig because I didn't say the right things. I mean, you know, it's, uh, show business is a very weird mistress. Um, uh, hyper. And she, uh, for, for Sandler, he, here's how flighty he is and I, I don't like those kind of people because they, they screw me up I, and I got enough problems mental <laughs> problems because uh, uh, I did I did Billy Madison I got you know really good reviews on it uh, so it was pretty you bad. deserved an Oscar movie. in my book for, oh, for me oh. yeah well I, I didn't even I didn't like the movie I mean it's, Sandler is not a cool guy no, cool? Mm. not at all. He's a, he's a genius at comedy. He knows his audience. He knows business, but how he operates in the world is, uh, you know, I mean, probably now, I mean, you know, he's gotten older and he's kind of off that, but, but he, like, for instance, um, he would call me, he's a prankster. Mm. So he would call me in the middle of the night. No, not me. He wouldn't call, he wouldn't call me. He'd have his girlfriends. Not his girlfriends, his girlfriends. So at four in the morning, if I had a six o'clock wake up call, at four in the morning, I get to go, hi, Larry, can I come up to visit you? And I'd hear him giggling and tell Adam to go fuck themselves. 
<laughs> I mean, you know, and then he would, you know, like that laugh, ha, 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 that laugh that I do in the movie. Oh. I didn't want to do it. I hate that laugh. I did that in, in public school. And somehow he found out that I did that. And he fooled me. He tricked me into doing that on screen in the movie. I wouldn't do it. I refused to do it. He badgered me during one lunch hour. Just kept on saying, come on, do the face, do the face. You know, I, I said, what face? He said, you know, that funny face that you do, you know, the mouse, the mouse thing. And I go, oh, man, I don't want to do that. I did that in public school and high school. How did you find out about that? He said, never mind, just do it, just do it. And I go, hey, man, I'm eating my lunch, you know. I, he called me over to the table. I mean, let me go back. No, I'm not letting you go back until you do that funny face. So I want to see the funny face. So now everybody at his table, you know, you sit at round tables, you know, everybody's eating cool and stuff. So now everybody at the table is shutting up and they're just watching me, waiting and seeing this argument going on between me and him. So finally, I said, okay, well, you let me go back to my table and I can eat lunch. I'll do it once, okay? And then I'm, I'm leaving. And he goes, yeah, 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 just do it. So I did this funny face, which I'll not do for you guys or anybody else ever again. You got it on tape in the movie. Watch it. Okay, so I did it. I did it. And he laughed. He actually laughed. He said, oh, wow, man, that's really funny. And everybody at the table kind of giggled. So I, he said, so I, okay, can I go now? He says, yeah, yeah, all right, go. I went back to my table. That afternoon, we shot the scene in which I did it. So we, uh, he's talking to, I'm talking to him in the scene. We did the first take, first take, take. Okay, we rehearsed, we rehearsed. And you know, that's, everything's fine. Then he goes, okay, action. So we're talking and we're talking. And in the middle of the scene, because I'm an improviser, you know, back then I was, it's still my head. He goes, hey, in the middle of the scene, he goes, hey, Carl, why don't you do that funny face for my girlfriend here or for, the, for this lady here? Whatever. Veronica Vaughn. Yeah. Why don't you do it? Why don't you do that funny face? So I, because I knew the camera was, ro you know, rolling, I just did it automatically, you know, like, like it's a suggestion from the audience, you know, hey, do a funny face. You know, I just did it. And, and as soon as I, would, I did it, I, I hated myself. I hated myself. But I did the rest of the scene. And it, when, when the director called cut, I said to myself, I'm not going to do that again. And Adam, I was, that's what I said in my head. And Adam said out loud, all right, let's move on. And, and, he, and he started walking away because he knew I wouldn't do it again. And he didn't want to do another take. So he just left the scene. So we had to move on. And I said, fuck, man, it's on tape now forever. It's on camera. Oh, shit. I hate it. I really do to this day. It's so silly and stupid. Uh, you know, hey, you do things in life. But you uh, keep on yeah, I mean, it's, it is, yeah, it's, it's, it it's, is what it is. It's, but it's I mean, things scene. like that. See, those are the kind of things that I, t I would be telling in my stand up, you know, things that happened to me but not in movie terms, but in just neighborhood terms. Like when I was a young kid, I, was a, I had a bully on my block, who was also my friend, because he was on my block, but he was a bully. And sometimes he'd just tell me to do stupid things because he wanted to bully me. And he could beat me up. I mean, so he'd say, okay, Larry, you can't walk on this side of the street. You're gonna have to cross over the other side of the street. What do you, what do you mean? I'm just walking, man. I'm sorry, you can't walk. I'm not gonna let you go by. You have to cross over, go around me. I'm standing here. And I would tell him, no, I'm not. I'm going to go. He'd go, boom, you know. I'd go, what the fuck? And he would do this, man, like every, like, you know, at least once a week. He would just. So one day I hit him with a brick. You know. <laughs> fuck it. Where's that? You see, Where's that so that's, like you know, that? that's the kind of humor. No, right. no, not violent. Not that violent. But, I mean, you know, things that happened to me during the day and how I either got out of a situation or into a situation. And now it's the same thing, only it's movies and it's a set and they're also making a movie and I'm still trying to, you know, it's just really weird. Like I, I, I would have arguments with uh, 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 Clint Eastwood, Escape from Alcatraz and uh, the director, wow, Siegel, Don Siegel. I, I, I would have that relationship. My relationship with Clint Eastwood was a fellow actor. Mm. you know, past the awe of being with Clint Eastwood. He treated me like a fellow actor, you know. But uh, Don Siegel treated me like his grandson. So it was like a grandfather, grand, 
grandson relationship. And I, I loved it. I thought it was really funny because I could, I could jerk his chain, you know, and he'd have to take it because, hey, grandpa, hey. Or he would put me on and I have to take it because, hey, it's grandpa, it's a director, it's, you know. But we were, we, were, we were friends, like he would say, I'd say, he wanted me to cry in my crying scene. He would go like, um, hey, Larry, uh, he'd come up to me. I'd be playing cards with the crew. And he'd go, he'd stand behind me and he'd go, um, and I'd see the, the, the crew look up like this. There's somebody behind me and I turn around and it's the director, Don Siegel. And he's just with this dour face, just like that. He's looking down at me. I go, oh, hi. He says, Larry, what are you doing? Like he's in shock, you know, like, Larry, what are you doing? I'm playing cards with the crew. Yeah, but you got a scene coming up. I said, yeah, but it's not for two hours. He said, you know, you have to cry in this scene. It's the last scene when they leave me behind and I'm mm. trapped in this, my cell and I'm just going. Ooh. He says, this is a crying scene. It's an important scene. Said, yeah, yeah, I know. Well, I mean, uh, aren't you going to prepare for it or anything? Now, he knew that I wasn't an actor. I mean, that I didn't hold myself as an actor. He, but, but I was holding my own. It's just he knew about me. He said, yeah, but aren't you going to prepare? I go, mm, uh, I don't. Well, do you think you can cry in the scene? That's the important thing. I need you to cry. Can you cry in the scene? I said, I don't know. He said, well, then if you don't know, I would suggest you go prepare. And then he walks away. Now the crew is like saying that. I go, oh, look, I got to leave. I'm sorry. You know, I cash in. I go with my, and I'm trying, I can't cry. I'm not an actor. I don't know where you get that from, you know? And I'm trying to think of bad things. It doesn't know. I'm so, uh, what he did say was, he said, and if you can't cry, if you, if you don't know how to cry, he says, I think you just slap yourself silly until you can. He used that phrase, slap yourself silly until you can. <laughs> He's what? So, no, no uh, that no, was Don right Siegel there. telling me if, uh, you know, the, the, the crying scene. You know, go and rehearse, you got to repair. And if you don't think you can cry, slap yourself silly until you can. This is an important scene. And he walks away. Okay, so I'm in my dressing room. I'm th and I'm slapping myself because I can't cry. And I'm, boom, my face is red, but I'm not crying. Uh, so I figured, well, uh, let me think. Of, okay, my backstory. Okay, so I thought of an excuse why Charlie Butts wouldn't cry in this scene. And uh, so I, I find him. I find him. Where's Don Siegel? I got to talk to him. So he goes, yeah, Don. And he's standing alone, luckily. So I go up to him, Don, Don. He's standing in a hallway. I don't know, it's Alcatraz. So we're standing on you know, cement all over the place. So he's standing, I go, hey, Don, can I talk to you for a second? Yeah, what? He says, uh, I say, um, look, look, Charlie Butts wouldn't cry in this scene. Really? Why not? Uh, well, because, um, see, uh, in his in his backstory, I have a backstory for him. He doesn't cry very easily, and he wouldn't cry in this particular situation because I, you know, I went over it, and I thought Charlie Butts wouldn't cry in this scene. Really? Okay, well, look, Larry, here's the thing. There he goes. I have, a, I have a movie here. I have a huge arc and he goes, huge arc. And he puts his huge arc in the sky. And he says, in this movie, it's all guys. It's all testosterone. And all they want to do, Larry, is they want to fight and they want to get out of there. And they, they're angry, see? So I need some other kind of emotion in this whole movie that I have here. Maybe somebody, I don't know, another emotion like, like, like crying. I need somebody to cry right about here. You know who's in that scene, Larry? You're in that scene and you're gonna cry in that scene, okay? And and uh, <laughs> it's really funny. He had called over his, uh, I said, okay, okay. He had called over his, uh, I left out a very interesting part, but I'll just tell you, it's not part of the story. But he called over his, his girl Friday, Carol, who was 20, about 25, 26, 27. She was his secretary and basically she walked around with a notebook and she just followed him around and he would say, you know, make this note, blah, 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 she'd write it down. She also had a copy of the script. She was just right there all the time. He calls, he calls her over, he says, uh, hey, um, Carol was her name. Carol, would you come over here for a second? He said to me, he says, would you tell Carol uh, this, what you just told me about the backstory? This is before he exploded with the art. Right. He goes, would you, would you tell Carol what you just told me about the art. So she didn't know what the hell was going on and neither did I. I didn't understand why I had to tell her. But I said, okay, and I'm 
Paul and I, you know, hey, well, you know, I got this backstory and he wouldn't cry in the scene, blah, 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 blah. So that's what I told him. And then she looks at Don and she looks at me and says, yeah, so? She says, okay, Don says. Now, Carol, would you please tell me what the fuck this guy's talking about? I need somebody to cry right here. He's pointing to the ceiling. I need somebody to cry right here. <laughs> so she says, so she says, well, I don't know. She says, thank you, Carol. You know, he, he walks away. She says, okay, you got that, Larry? Goodbye. And he walked away. So I'm left there now, bereft. I don't know what to do. This is my first big movie. My, my first big movie. And, you know, I just gotten rid of all this awe. And now I'm into fear and I'm going to be fired. Holy cow. So I go into my dressing room and I just can't do it. And then all of a sudden the AD comes in. He says, you're up. Okay. I go down to the set. They got everything all set for me, you know. This huge pan Panaflex camera that's about as, as big as you. And he goes, okay, you ready, Larry? And I go, yeah, yeah, I'm ready. And I'm not ready at all. But I figured I'm fired. And my go-to is, I don't give a fuck. I'm not an actor. That, that's my go-to. Right. So, and then he puts me, he sits me down, and he puts the camera this far away. Now, I'll do it sideways. He puts the camera right here. That's where, the, that's where the box is. That's around the lens, which is about right here. So, so, that, so this is frightening, man, to have a I've never had a camera that close to me. It's like you're in my space, man. Move back a little. Uh, so, all right, but I'm there. And he goes, okay, you ready to cry, Larry? I go, yeah, I'm ready to cry. I'm not ready to cry. I go, yeah, yeah, I'm ready to cry. He says, okay, ready? Gets me, he says, and action, Larry, cry. And I go, uh, <laughs> nothing. And I'm gone. And all of a sudden, I hear Don Siegel go, Hey, Carl, bring it in. And Carl, this uh, crew guy, big crew guy, comes in with a perfume bottle. You know the grandmother perfume bottles? You know the ones with the little bulb at the end, which you go... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he comes in with a grandma <laughs> squeeze bottle. And he goes right in between the box and me. You know, it's right, right there. Right in he sticks it in between and he goes... And this mist just... And then he goes, roll it. And I, tears start pouring down my eyes. And I go, ooh. And so I just, you know, and so I had made a sad face and I'm crying and crying. And he goes, cut. Great, Larry. That was really fantastic. Thank you, Carl. All right, moving on. Let's go. Boom and move on. <laughs> and he knew from the time he was standing behind me in the card game, there was a put on the whole fucking afternoon. From the card game on was all it put on. He was playing. He knew about spray. the perfume yeah. bottle. It's he called was Winter Green. He it's was used in every that. crying scene in the movies. Wow, he's planning that the whole time, huh? Yeah, I mean, so and I asked him about that later. You know, the next day when everything was calm, uh, I said, you know, what, what was? Why did you do that, man, Grandpa? Why did you do that? And he said, well, that's how we made movies in the old days. You know, we would, you know, people would, you know. Do a close-ups with no clothes on. It's <laughs> a close-up. You know, so you know something that the movie people wouldn't know. Not no clothes on, but they would take off because it was very hot. He explained it to me. He said it's very hot under the lights and uh, like in um, in the um, uh, 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 I can't remember the name of the movie. I don't know. Where, where, where they're wearing suits, old suits, old time suits, suits from the eighteen nineties. They were, they were uh, and they're real suits, but they're wool suits. So the actors would take their pants off and do sh scenes in their underwear because of the heat, but it was only from the chest up. So, you know, they would, you wouldn't know it, but everybody's putting it. Sometimes he would go by this thing and he would see uh, Broderick Crawford and um, uh, some other actor, like Clint Eastwood, but Roderick Crawford and somebody fighting on the sides of the road and police. And he, and they were in his shot movie. He was directing this movie. I can't remember what his name, the other actor's name was. They were fighting, had a fist fight. The cops had broken it up. Their cars were pulled over on the side of the road. It was PCH, which goes along the seashore. Uh, and, and it was seven o'clock at night. 
It was still light out. And he slowed down because all the traffic was slowing down to see this fight and the cops on the side of the road. And as he slowed down, he saw that those are my two stars. They're fighting on the side of the road. It's seven o'clock at night. They, they have an, a, a seven o'clock shoot tomorrow morning. Should I stop and break this up? But I got to get home and eat and get some sleep because I got to get up at like four in the morning. So he, no, he said, no, fuck them. I'm, I'm, I'm going home. I want to get some sleep. So he just passed them by, but he wondered if they'd show up the next morning. And sure enough, the next morning they showed up, they were scarred up, they went into makeup, they covered it all up. And it was like it, nothing ever happened. Like they remembered their lines, they were very friendly on the set. Da, 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 da. You know, they, even though they hated each other when they walked away, they did their jobs, they were professional. And he was very proud of that, it's Don Siegel how they made movies in the old days, how, how loose they were, because they were so uptight. If you look at old photos, when they were making black and white movies, look at the crews. The crews were all dressed in suits. That's how serious they were in those days. So, you know, they had to let off steam and he just was carrying, he was still doing it. I thought I thought he was the greatest guy in the world. I, I, I loved him. Incredible. I love Wonderful story. Incredible. And you, I mean, it's listen. It's a great movie too. Yeah, well, amazing. Incredible movie. Incredible movie. And you were, I know you don't, you don't want to be called an icon, but you are a stand-up comedian. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, I've oversold myself. <laughs> we love you. We're, we're so happy you came on our incredible. podcast. Thank you so much, man. I, this has been incredible. You, you, the, the stories you gave us, you know, the things you've, you've done. It's, it's, uh, oh, thank you guys. Thank you for waiting. I was on, I was on course, a bike man. ride. I thought, oh my God, these guys, I have to get there. I have to get there. All good. I have no All idea good. how many people I ran over. <laughs> <laughs> All good. But thank you guys. Enjoy the rest thank of your you. day. Thank you. So Love much. you, Larry. And you too. Love you. Love hey, you. anytime you need a, you know, a replacement, give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Larry. Okay. Take it easy. Amazing. Man. Hey, uh, hey, Larry. Yeah. This is uh, Tony. Uh, we had emailed about uh, doing a podcast, the Seinfeld. Oh, holy shit! <laughs> what time is it now? What time do we go? Are you on now? Yeah, we were going to be on now. It was going to be two Eastern. So, I mean, we can set it. If, if you, I don't know if you, you know, what are you thinking? I'm on my bike outside. Okay. I mean, I can come. I can come back, but I'm on my bicycle. So let me see. Fifteen minutes. Um, yeah, it'll be a half hour before I could get online. Is that? Can you wait that long? I mean, I think so. What do you What do you think? Oh, uh, can you? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, of course. I think you are. Before then. What's that? I mean, I, I said at the most is a half hour. Yeah, we'll uh, be the here. Least is you, we'll be on. Twenty minutes. The link we sent you is open. We're just sitting on. We'll just wait whenever you're ready. Just pop in. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll get there as fast as I can. Awesome, okay, thank bye. you. Appreciate it. Bye.